we are at the still at the front end of a series that's going to take us about ten weeks altogether about going deeper with God. We spoke about that two weeks ago uh, as an overall topic. Why should we go deeper with God? How do we go deeper with God? And last week we looked at uh, the beginning of what will form this series, the fruit of the Spirit. We looked at a deeply loving heart. If you were to see the text up on the screen, no, I think I'm in Canaan and I look this way. I look this way. Last week we looked, uh, we looked at a deeply loving heart as the first of the fruits. It comes first in the scripture that we're going to read. And today we are going to move on to a deeply joyful heart. So, Without further ado, let's go ahead and dig into the text. It should be on the screen now. And I wonder if you would read this text with me. It comes from the book of Galatians. And this chapter 5, verses 22 through 25, is the overall text or the overall guiding text for our series on going deeper with God. The fruit of the Spirit. Last week it was love. This week is a deeply joyful heart. Let's read together. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no while we see these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires for their sinful nature to his cross and crucified the real earth. Since we are living by the Spirit, we Let us follow the Spirit's feeling in every, every part of our lives. This is the Word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. The word congruent is going to loom large this morning. Congruence means agreement. As if to say that two or more of anything are equally or evenly matched or parallel. The pews in our auditorium are congruent with each other. They're the same size, the same length, the same height. And when you sit on one, oh no, it's not just the same. Y'all sit in the same place every week. <laughs> sat in a different place. <laughs> but they are constructed congruently. If a psychologist or psychiatrist speaks about congruence when it relates to people, he's pointing to the inner person matching up with the outer person. The opposite would be the one that we call phony, or somebody who's putting on an act. They're not really what they are. I heard about a mascot in an army company. He was just a little stray dog, and the enlisted men cared for him, loved him, and that dog followed at their tired feet on long hikes, KP duty, digging latrine trenches, all the mundane details of being a soldier. One day, there were two officers walking along in the company grounds, and they spotted the dog running along, just jumping, playful. As soon as the dog spotted the two officers, he started hobbling along on three legs. <laughs> But when he got past them and out of, just about out of their sight, he resumed walking normally and jumping around and playing. The explanation is obviously that he had gotten the idea from the enlisted men that staying off the nasty, dirty details, the only way you could really do that is to claim that you had poor feet or sore feet. Well, congruence in the believer's life has to do with matching up the reality of Christ in us as Paul wrote in Galatians about the fact that we are walking in the Spirit, matching up the reality of Christ in us with what we do. Now, I understand that when there really isn't a match, we tend to think of the person as a phony. Well, he's one way down the church, and boy, you ought to see him when he And there is that. There is human judgment. But it's not exactly what I would call phony. It's what I would call miserable Christianity. This happens when people accept Christ as Savior because they've heard there's joy and truth and life in Jesus. We experience the wonder of being forgiven and being part of the family of God. And all of this leads 
us to join in with a church. We join in the membership of a church. We become part of a church. We want all of those wonderful Christians to, I mean, they seem to have it all together, and so we want them to think well of us, so we develop what? A churchy personality to take the place of the real us. I mean, especially while we're in the church house. Our churchy personality says things like, Amen, righteousness, sanctification. Words that we would never say down on the job, right? And we talk about joy and peace and answered prayer, all that stuff. But all the while, inwardly, what we feel is somewhat guilty. Like we're having a, a life filled with just half truth. We're not quite a genuine part of the whole thing. We talk about joy, but we feel frustration. We honor truth in our hearts, but we constantly fall into that churchy personality to hide the real us. We talk about new life in Christ, but somehow it's more existence than abundant living. I mean, we know it's a lie, but we're stuck. We don't feel any joy inside. It's like eating us alive in there. What we have is a full-blown case of miserable Christianity. Like the poet wrote, there's no joy in Mudville. Casey has struck out. If you've ever felt that way, no, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. Make the altar. Hearts fluttered. If you've ever felt that way, if you know someone who feels like that, please know that there is a reason why that happens. The root cause of miserable Christianity is found in the misunderstanding of what it takes or what makes for a genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. Somehow, we feel like we've got to manufacture that kind of joy, that joyful personality, that joyful speech. We can understand this by examining the truth about what our true calling is in Jesus Christ. And I have three truths to share with you, like every preacher has three points in a poem. We got three this morning. Truth number one is that you and I are called to a life of joy. We are called to a life of joy, not the frustration that I spoke about before. We are called to an honest life of joy. We are called and we are gifted by God to be joyful. The word for joy in the New Testament is the word kara, and we hear the word charismatic or character. Um, it's literally translated as gift. Jesus was a joyful, happy person. He was alive with living, you might say, and he wanted to give that as a gift to us. John chapter 15, verse 11 says, I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. Yes, your joy will overflow. I can say that Jesus was a very joyful person because I read in the New Testament that children... <laughs> We're always hanging out around him. Children would go to him. They wanted to be around him. You remember that incident where the children were coming to Jesus and the disciples said, whoa, 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 don't walk the master. What did Jesus say? Hold on, guys. These are the ones that I really want to talk to today. And they sat on his lap, I suppose. I always think about the two teenagers that were standing in the Sunday school building during uh, in between Sunday school worship. And as they talked, this grumpy old sourpuss walked past, and one of the teens said to the other, if that's what 30 years of Christianity will do for you, I want out now. <laughs> Dr. Tommy Starks was my professor of missions in seminary. He used to tell us that he enjoyed his Christianity, but it wasn't always so. In one class, I recall him telling us that when he was growing up, his the church that his folks brought him to seem to think that becoming a Christian was something like writing down ten things that you promise never to do again and then being miserable for Jesus the rest of your life. Well, Dr. Starks could laugh at himself, too. There was one time he was on a mission trip 
and he preached to a very large Spanish-speaking crowd, and even though he spoke the language, it was only a little bit that he spoke the language, and so he had an interpreter. And I've had the privilege of speaking to a group that didn't speak the language I spoke, and I had an interpreter in, in South Africa. Um, and it's, it's not an easy task, especially if you're looking for reaction from the crowd of what you're saying. But at any rate, Dr. Starks had an interpreter. He wanted to break the ice, so he decided to tell a little funny story through the interpreter. The interpreter didn't exactly say what Dr. Starks said. This is exactly what the interpreter said to the crowd. He said, the white man has told a joke. I don't understand it. I don't think you will either, but let's be nice to him. Everybody <laughs> laugh when I count the three. Oh, no, do <laughs> I think that Christians are called to a life of joy. There's another related word in scripture for joy that means delight. And the same word is used in Luke to announce the birth of Jesus. He brought great joy, delight. What do you delight in, aside from fried chicken? I mean, what do you delight in? Fried chicken is not a bad analogy, you know. It's good going down, and it's great staying there. In our text this morning, Jesus declared that it was this kind of delight that was to be in us. And I want you to know, and this is an important distinction. I'm not an English major, but I know the distinction between a noun and a verb. A verb shows actions. Uh, you know, he lifted the cup. Lifted is the verb there. He lifted the cup. A noun is a person, place, or thing. So the noun in that illustration is what? It's the cup, right? He lifted the cup. Jesus used a noun to describe the light. We would think, well, I feel the light. We would think it's a verb. But Jesus used it as a noun. You see, joy is not something we do. It's not a verb. It's not something we act out. It is in reality that which is within what we are. Joy is the noun. It's what we are. We are joyful people because Jesus makes it so. Paul's letter to the Philippian church in chapter 4 tells us that the joy leads to the outward signs of rejoicing. The joy that Jesus places in you, even if you don't feel it, it's there. It's part of the fruit of the Spirit. It's what God does in us to change us from what we were to what we are, joyful people. In other words, the joy that Jesus places in us does something to us, which is a lasting rejoicing. Philippians, Paul had written, Rejoice! And again I say rejoice! There was a young man, and this is a favorite story of Dr. Jerry Brazil, another favorite professor of mine. He used to tell us in a uh, Cajun accent, I can't, I can't imitate that whatsoever, but Dr. Brazil was brought up around uh, uh, Baton Rouge, as he would say. That the young man got saved on the first night of a five-day revival. And the second night, the fellow came back, and all through the service, this young boy would shout, Hallelujah, Amen. He was just happy, happy, happy. The pastor went to him and said, Son, you need to be a little bit quieter. But it didn't take. And third and fourth nights were the same thing, shouting, Amen, Hallelujah, all through the meeting. So the pastor got the lay leader, Debbie, got the lay leader, <laughs> and they talked to this joy-filled new believer pastor said, son, this year's the last night of our meeting. Won't you find a way to just settle down a little bit? I tell you, with all your amen, somebody's going to make a mistake and misunderstand. Somebody's going to mistake us for a Pentecostal church. Tell you what, if you calm down for tonight, we'll buy you a brand new pair of boots. Well, the boy agreed. But about halfway through the service, the, the joy was just bubbling up in his kid. So he thought he was going to burst wide open. He squirmed and he tried his best to contain himself, but he just wouldn't do it. The choir then sang a beautiful, wonderful praise song. The boy couldn't stand it a moment longer. He stood right up in the middle of everything. He said, Amen, Amen, Hallelujah, boots or no boots, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. 
I've heard it said that ha happiness is excitement that has found a little settling down place, but in the corner, there's always that little corner that keeps flapping around. You know what that is? That's the joy indicator. That is the joy indicator. Joy does indeed fill the believer and causes the believer to be happy. We have got something wonderful that causes us to be filled with joy. What is that something? We're sinners who have been rescued and redeemed from the penalty of our own sinfulness. I tell you what, we are called to joy. A second truth that I'd like to share with you is that we are also called to a life of discipleship and service. Matthew 16, verse 24, Jesus said this to his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Now, the unmistakable meaning of this verse, this is hard to mess up, folks. This is an unmistakable meaning of this verse, is that the disciple of Christ must serve the same way the Master served. The reality of salvation is that we not only come to Jesus so that He can forgive our sins, He also expects us to forsake our sins. Did you get that one? He not only forgives, He expects us to forsake those sins. We place our lives in His hand. We become like a tool ready to be used in His service. You look at the larger picture that's drawn for us by the words that Jesus used in the scripture. First of all, he says, deny self. That means that we fully renounce the ownership of our own life and destiny. We make God the captain of everything we do. He's the commander. Then secondly, he says, take up the cross. That's the burden of sacrifice. We're ready to place God's kingdom ahead of our personal pursuits. What do you mean, Pastor? I mean, God comes ahead of your job. He comes ahead of your family. Trust me. He comes ahead of your hobbies. And He comes ahead even of your own life. That breathing in and out thing that we all do. And then thirdly, He says, follow me. Deny self, take the cross, follow me. Which means perfect obedience. I know none of us are perfect. You won't be perfect. But we are to be perfect in love, which leads to an obedience type of lifestyle. I have to admit to you that I am not comfortable with all the demands the New Testament makes on my life. But following Jesus means serving, and a servant does what his master desires. We have to be faithful servants, understanding or not. Whether we understand his reasoning, whether we understand his purpose, whether we understand anybody else's reaction, we do our part that he gives to us. God is the master architect. He knows exactly how you and I fit into his building plans. He's building a kingdom. We think about building a church, but he's building the church. He's building the kingdom with and through his church. We do the job we're fitted for and gifted to do. So, two truths so far. We're called to joy. We're called to serve. And truth number three is that joy, joy, joy and serving are inseparable. You cannot separate the one from the other. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Seek the kingdom of God above all else. Live righteously and He will give you everything you need. <coughs> Throughout the Sermon on the Mount, from which this comes, Jesus shared the keys to abundant life, a life of joy. Many times the Lord used the words, blessed. And there's a whole section in Matthew 5 that starts out that way. Blessed are me. Blessed are you when. Blessed, blessed, blessed. How does that translate into today's language? Oh, how happy, how joyful, how joyful you are when you're meek, when your spirit is connected with God, when you're persecuted by those who would do evil to you. What's connected to and what's conditional of that happiness is the life of serving. 
Jesus teaches that material things are not the purpose for which we are given life, but material necessities will be given to us because God provides for those who seek his kingdom as priority number one. I would venture to say there's not many people in here that have ever missed a meal. You may have missed one or two on purpose because you're on that four-letter word. It begins with die, ends in et. But God has seen to it that you have had the necessities of life. Because God provides for those who seek their kingdom as priority number one. My wife's experience as a believer has been such that whenever I put aside my own agenda and I concentrate on serving the Lord and serving Him with the best that I have, whatever result that comes, one thing is always consistent, joy, unspeakable and full of glory. That's what I feel deep down in my soul when I'm obedient to the Lord. Even if it costs me, especially when it costs me. So I have a question for the house this morning. And it's simply this. What is it that you're looking for? Are you looking for a life of joy? Do you want to live with a deep down feeling of peace and contentment? Do you desire congruence to feel the joy within and to match it up and live a life that matches up with that joy? An uncomplicated life where truth is what naturally comes out of your mouth, where kindness is the reaction to just about anything that happens, where acceptance when you don't understand where somebody else is or why they do what they do, when those things are the natural things of response from your life, it's because joy has taken over down there. If you've given your sins to Jesus to be forgiven, you experience the joy of being saved. You can think back on that when you gave your heart to Christ. There was a lot of joy that day, wasn't there? But listen, there is deeper joy available. And that is to be found in commitment to the Lord, in serving Him. Because it's when you give your service to Him that you are taking up your cross and following Him. It's when you've denied yourself and you've taken up His cross. And joy is the unexpected marriage partner to service. It's like the song from my parents' generation a long time ago. Love and marriage, love and marriage, go together like a horse and carriage. You can't have one. You're a really old group, aren't you? <laughs> You can't have one, you cannot serve without receiving a sense of joy. You cannot have a sense of joy if you won't serve. God has given these instructions for the believer to bear spiritual fruit of joy. It's a life that is filled and abundant with joy. Those instructions are found in the Bible and in capsule form, I think we could sum it up, this whole understanding this way. Love Christ, live for Christ, serve Christ, and be filled with joy. Imagine, here's the best offer that you've ever received. You give you, totally, with complete devotion to the Lord. And in return, He gives you all the peace you can handle, a home in heaven, love with no end, and the protection of His daily care. Beloved, if that doesn't cause real joy to well up inside of you, your joy mechanism is in trouble. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, let the church say, Amen. Trust and obey. Did you realize this hymn?